Jeffrey Tucker is the editorial director for the American Institute for Economics Research. And he also wrote Right Wing Collectivism, The Other Threat to Liberty. Um, I'm a huge fan of Jeffrey Tucker and I really enjoy this conversation. I hope you enjoy it too. Hello, Jeffrey Tucker. Thanks so much for coming on the show. Nice to be here. Thank you for having me. Oh, you're welcome. Um, okay. How is your year going so far? Are you one for yearly goals? And if so, uh, how are you getting on? Ah, oh, wow. That's a great question. You know, I, I never set out to have goals. But what happens at the beginning of every year is I get slightly bored and I think, wow, what important, wonderful thing is going to happen this year that's never happened before. And so I, I end up making these goals just because the beginning, beginning of the year is a good time to sort of think of your life as an exciting, valuable, productive person. And so every year I do, in fact, develop goals, achievable ones if possible. And so this year, my r real ambition uh, – when I say ambition is like not exclusive of my daily work, but what I really hope to do is something I've always wanted to do professionally, but was never in the right position to be able to do it. And that is to establish a, a, a serious, viable, robust uh, uh, book publishing operation uh, using Creative uh, Commons. And I want it to be commercially viable and liberate the texts of authors and writers and scholars and researchers who who otherwise have to depend on university presses and that sort of thing. And so AIR is kind of a high prestige uh, name. And so I really kicked it into full operation. We're starting with reprints and that I've got like five book manuscripts I'm working on and that sort of thing. And it's been really tremendously exciting for me. Awesome. Um, were you, uh, was AIR um, involved in the recent, um, discovering of the Lysander Spooner missing texts. Yes, that's a good example because we published volume one of that and now uh, volume two is is on its way. So that's a good example. I mean, like, like the missing texts from the 1880s, 1890s from this great thinker, like if you're going to try to get that published at Cambridge or something like that, it's going to be like a two-year wait and and uh, I don't know, there's going to be all kind of struggles over, I don't know, copyright and then whatever kind of new material you add to the old material, they're going to want to take possession of it and you can't run it. And then they're going to charge one hundred and forty eight dollars <laughs> yeah. for the physical book and then even more for digital. I mean, I saw a digital edition the other day that was uh, sixty dollars, sixty dollars to access, you know, a, an infinitely reproducible file, you know, and this is Routledge that did that. I'm like. Guys, this is not working. This is not good for the world that you're publishing this way. So, yeah. So publishing those Lysander Spooner books are really important. And what we're doing is we're making the PDF free online. Our, I think the hard copies are like $20. The digital file to download is $5. And the author and editor gets to retain his intellectual property rights, which to me is the only way to publish that's consistent with human rights. Right, but uh, you've been um, skeptical of IP in the past. Um, uh, how does how does that how does that jive? Well, I, I, I well, you know, you have to use uh, copyright uh, in some sense, but um, I mean, I'm, I'm against it completely. But now we have Creative Commons licenses, so the license we use is the Creative Commons International Attribution. And what I tell authors is, unlike regular publishers, we're not taking your rights from you. You retain your rights as fully as completely as you possess them now, but through publishing, you share those rights with the world. Like they're infinitely reproduced. So everybody else in the world enjoys all the human rights to information that you currently possess from your individual point of view. Publishing with us makes no difference from your point of view. It's just that now the whole world has access to the same uh, uh, ideas that you have access to. And to me, that's just a normal thing to say like that's the way the world would work were it not for the legislation of intellectual property um but i have to explain it to authors because they're almost always confused about this issue i mean authors routinely sign contracts it's like bloody outrageous like they'll work 10 years on a book submit it to oxford university press oxford comes back with a contract that says uh, we're going to sell a lot of copies of the book and they're going to get royalties which is never true i mean yes it's true if you do sell 
fifty thousand copies you're going to get royalties, but you will never sell that many. And it's just about don't. impossible, I think. It's impossible. And then if the author imagines himself or herself to be really savvy, you know, uh, the author will say to the Oxford, "I want to retain my copyright." So then Oxford will go, "Oh, when were those types, huh?" Well, you can have your copyright. So the book will say, "Copyright, you know, Joe Blow." What they don't understand is that that copyright. Uh, in their name means literally nothing because the distribution rights are retained by the publisher. And those distribution rights will are basically because of digital publishing last in perpetuity 70 years after the lifetime of the author. I mean, it's so it's egregious. So that I, I've seen too many authors get tricked into this. I can't think of a single author I know who's a specialist in intellectual property rights enough to be able to understand how they're being basically robbed. So, you can imagine my passion for shattering the system. I've seen this thing work in my entire career, and it's just like tragedy after tragedy. And so now, being at AIR, I have this opportunity to actually compete directly with these university presses and commercial presses and, and help authors retain rights to their content. And to me, it's just like liberation. I mean, I, I love that I'm able to do this now. It's super exciting. It's a great project uh, just to uncover these things going back to Spooner specifically, um, was anything surprising in the actual content for you? Oh, Spooner. Well, sure. I mean, I would consider him a little bit confused about monetary theory itself. And it was kind of typical at the time. Like, in the times of the gold standard, free market thinkers thought there was some kind of scammy thing going on with the big bankers and government because they kind of cobbled together this gold standard stuff. And so a lot of them thought that there was an artificial restriction on the volume of money that was coming out. That was their kind of theory. Uh, their moral intuitions weren't wrong, but their economics were often a little bit confused. But the good thing about Spooner is that though you you kind of run into these confusions about exactly what is the basis for money and credit, like what are the conditions under which it's expanded and, and uh, allocated. Um, but the good thing about Spooner is that he was really radically free market. Like he thought whatever the results would be, he knew for sure that money should remain a product of the market and banking itself should be a market-oriented service. So in that sense, it's really good. I mean, it didn't really have access to uh, uh, 20th century style um, monetary theory, sure. but, it's, it's, but it's a fascinating thing to read from a history of uh, economics point of view. And I think it still has a lot to teach us because, I mean, basically we live in a world of nationalized money still. And we're in the process of kind of breaking that up with the advent of uh, privatized crypto and that sort of thing. So it's, we're going through a transition right now. And to that extent, Spooner is really a pretty good guide. If, uh, if I may, um, just to uh, change gears a little bit, um, mm -hmm. could I get you uh, to give a quick take on the – I know this is very boring and, and frustrating, but uh, a quick take on the latest news in the culture war. Uh, the first thing – the uh, the Gillette ad. I don't think I've heard your commentary on that yet. Uh, my commentary on that is number one. I've not seen it. So, uh, oh. but and I and and but that's okay because I I see all the arguments on the left and the right. And so, so the right wing is like denouncing Gillette for selling out, and the left wing is like congratulating Gillette for being an enlightened and light of the Me Too moment and all the rest of it. My own attitude is that our society is way too politicized, and that these companies should not be browbeat into entering into the culture wars. I'm thoroughly bored by the culture wars. I think they're outrageous, but they're a consequence of the fact that the state is so involved in our lives that the stakes become really high about whether or not Gillette is perceived to be on the right side of the gender wars. I mean, I personally find that these gender wars are just an extension of the state's attempt to just turn everybody against everybody else. I mean, there's this widespread presumption that if one group is winning, then they've got to come at the expense of another group. And this has even reached all the way down into the sexual politics. And it's just disgusting. And uh, to me, it's just a great illustration of how uh, government is way too involved in our lives. I have no problem if Gillette wants to weigh in on the side of whatever kind of post-structuralist intersex intersectional, you know, cultural outlook at once but but i just keep getting the sense that these companies are doing this as a way of kind of finding favor among uh, consumers in light of their politics and it's just a great illustration to be about 
how politics is like weirdly invading a, a parts of our lives that it has no business in. What's been really frustrating is that when I first got into all this politics business, um, it seemed to be about what really mattered. But maybe I was just young and naive at the time, but it was it was about freedoms. It was about rights. It was about um, uh, the foundational things. But now, all of a sudden, we're expected to have an opinion on um, uh, an ad for uh, a razor blade or um, whether people should be called by whatever pronoun they um they like or whatever and it's like i don't i don't know why uh i ought to have an opinion on this why does it matter so much the uh people properly into the culture war catch things in terms of this is like the end of civilization uh so i think it really hit something there oh it's so true and what the reason for this is that we have this overweening monstrous state that's like crawling into every crevice of our lives and the state only operates on a zero-sum game. Like, like we're going to favor you, and that's going to harm you. We're going to favor you, and that's going to harm you. And so it's like this gigantic machinery of, of weaponized violence that's out there. And so now every conceivable cause and interest, whether it's religion or race or sex or uh, sexual gender identity and region and language and you name it, everybody's got uh, a thing that they're upset about and they want the state to weigh in uh, favoring them against their enemies. And I'm telling you, we started doing this, I don't know when, decades ago, but now it's reached this absurd proportion. So like nobody is winning. Everybody's mad all the time and our lives have become hyper-politicized and it's, it's getting tremendously invasive and uh, you know, to the point we can't even have friendships where somebody has a different uh, political point of view. It's, it's tremendously tragic. And I, what I think we're, we're observing is the um, kind of the culmination of a, as a, of, of a socialistic sort of quasi fascist view of history that was born in the early 19th century and, and pushed in the middle part of the 20th century to, uh, on the left and the right, really. To, to make it impossible for us to get along with each other. And the only people who really win from the struggle are powerful people behind the machinery of the state. Regular people will not win from the struggles. Um, in what way has it... Uh, first of all, is this, is this a phase? Is this going to bottom out at some point? Um, and if not, is there a way for us to personally secede from, from this culture war? Your first question is interesting. Is there a point at which it comes to an end? And I think about this virtually every day. I mean, I was around when the Soviet Union collapsed in 1990. And I wondered that, because it was a beautiful thing to see a regime just go and fall apart. And I wondered if we were kind of come to the point in the sort of totalitarian social democratic West, where there would be a loss of consensus and the thing would crumble in a similar way. Um, I don't know the scenario under which that happens, but I think it's actually possible. And and it has something to do with loss of of confidence in our in our overlords. In 1964, in the United States, 74 percent of the American people were willing to tell a pollster that they trusted the government to do the right thing. The last time this poll was taken, it was down to 15 percent. That's a dramatic decline in confidence in the state. And now you're starting to see these ha things happen every day in American politics that are further reducing public confidence in the state, like the shutdowns. So now we have these outages periodically. And now we've got the government's open, but it's only open for three more weeks, like a Hulu subscription or something. You know, you know it's becoming absurd. And, and I think it's going to uh, push ever more a loss of confidence. Now, the reason sometimes we don't see this or feel this is because uh, elite opinion makers and media are really invested in this. They love these conflicts because it's always a good headline. Like, you know, your, your iPhone's going off all the time with, oh, here's the latest piece of news. Here's another piece. And so they want you to click on it all the time to keep you really involved. But <clears throat> I don't think that average regular people are really – uh, as intense about this as the uh, opinion elite really are. The opinion elite is trying to snag you and rope you in and get you involved in their wars. The political elite is the same thing. They both have a mutual interest in making you crazy. You know, but it's absolutely unnecessary 
you can just leave this. I, in fact, there are easy things you could do. It's a stupid point, but my iPhone comes with a news app that was sending me notifications all the time. And I was like, oh, there's big news. Oh, better pick it up and look at it. Oh, my God, better click on it. This morning, I realized this is idiotic. If I want news on a particular thing, I'll look it up. And so I just deleted the app. Well, my phone's now quiet. <laughs> I mean, there's many things you can do. I think also developing a new internal conviction of, uh, of, of the liberal sensibility as, as enunciated over the centuries by great thinkers, uh, which really comes down to the conviction that society can work on its own. We don't have to be at war with each other all the time. We can get along with our brothers and sisters and, and develop beautiful forms of human community, be involved in them, recognize them when we see them, celebrate life. I think this is actually the best way to defeat the state. What I like about you is you have quite a balanced analysis. You have obviously you're very aware of the many ways in which the state encroaches on our lives and makes things horrible for us. But also um, you're one of the few people in our circles, I suppose, the classical liberal circles who will pick up a can of tin tuna and go, oh, isn't this amazing? Hey, guys, look at this. Uh, <laughs> well, when did is that is, is that something you had to cultivate? I, I don't think so. I mean. I'm not entirely sure, but I'm profoundly aware of of the history of the human experience, and and I'm enraptured by it, and I, I'm I never can shake that sense. Like the chef here at AIER on Thursday made some minestrone soup. It wasn't my favorite thing, um, but I was just amazed at the sheer number of vegetables in there. Like, where did they all come from? They're not growing out back. I mean, God knows where they came from. And it's full of these tomatoes and then this pasta that was made somewhere else and it had a vinegar. God knows where they came from. So I didn't really like it, but I was like enraptured by this stuff. And it really struck me as like this miracle. I mean, like for 150,000 years, human beings had to like struggle for the next meal and beat each other and kill each other just to get a bite to eat. And now I've got this smorgasbord of delicious things from all over the world in a little bowl. And I've just got a – it just appears before me. So anyway – he left some for the people that are residents at the, at the house, which you can see behind me. And the students the next night were going out and buying their own food and making their chicken things. And I'm like, why would you eat something else? We've got this beautiful minestrone soup. And they said, well, we had that yesterday. I'm like, isn't that just an incredible luxury? We've got a whole bowl of this minestrone soup. And yet you want to go out and have a salmon. You, you're thinking chicken tonight. And this is the kind of world we live in. I love that we live in that world, but I just wish we would more profoundly appreciate <laughs> the glory of the moment in which we live. Somebody else happened to me the other day. I was at out antique shopping. And you can't believe it. You was, simply would not believe it. But at this antique store, you can't believe what they had in the middle of the antique store. A payphone. Not right. a payphone to use, but they were selling a payphone booth as an antique. Yeah. I mean, they wanted like $450 for it. <laughs> so, <laughs> like, <laughs> we're coming to the point that a payphone is like this beautiful anachronism of the past. Oh, yes, the days of the payphone. I think I'd like to put one of those in my living room. <laughs> It is pretty pretty strange, and it, that time frame between um, technology that you're using now and an antique is becoming shorter and shorter because uh, uh, the MP3 player has become an, an antique as well. You know the old iPods that everyone was so uh, amazed by? Yeah, old hat now. I know. It's so funny. History's like on this fast forward. So I love that because uh, it made me realize, oh, yeah. I mean, I remember there was a time I would have. I remember using payphones outside of convenience stores. Like, wait, how did I, how did I do that? You know, and it's funny to me because when I was a little little boy, and I think about this all the time. My parents used to take me on long road trips because back in those days, it was a big deal to be able to drive a car across the country because you couldn't do that in the fifties, really. And and so by the 60s, by the late 60s, it was very common to have a car that could make it from Texas to California. And everybody did it. It's like, okay, here comes the summer. Let's go on a trip. Well, I was always bored. 
I was sitting in the back, you know, trying to find ways. And so I remember I used to take paper clips with me and bend the top of the paper clip, clip up and make it turn it into a little talking machine with an antenna, like a walkie-talkie, and hold it up to my ear and talk to my invisible friend, like the whole trip, like this. Oh, it sounds fun. It sounds great. And, and pretending like I had a little mobile phone. Or no, nobody knew what a mobile phone was, but I imagine that it was so I think about that every single time I pick up my iPhone I remember those little those days when I was a little boy and I had a little paper clip up to my ear and I dreamed of the day that I could wirelessly talk to anybody I wanted well how do you feel about this um trend of uh, everyone's a, a phone hater these days they're making us antisocial they're um taking people out of uh, out of the presence and, and all this stuff um I find that kind of sanctimonious what about you yeah, I agree with you. And I think the fix is actually not a big fix. It's like a small fix. We just need to kind of develop better etiquette about it. Um, and it, that's a simple problem. You remember the old days when mobile phones first came along? People would go into a restaurant. They'd be like, yeah, Joe, I know what you mean. You say, oh, sure. <laughs> and they were annoying, right? Talking loudly in a restaurant on their phone. Nowadays, you don't see that anymore. When people need to answer phones, they ex politely excuse themselves from the table and they go to and then they come back. So we developed an etiquette about it. I think it's the same thing. We need to develop an etiquette about when the phone buzzes, you don't have to always go, because you do leave the conversation. <clears throat> it's annoying. But the fact that so many people are annoyed by it means that it's being fixed. We just need to, we just need to get better at it. It's not, it's not complicated. It, it is an addiction and you can, it's not a, it's not a debilitating addiction. Just like cut it out. I mean, it's not. <laughs> if you don't like what's happening, what a technology is doing to you, there's an easy fix. Don't let that technology do that to you anymore. Very simple. Right. It it is. It's down to personal responsibility. And every new technology that comes along has this. Um, has this. Uh, it's, it's always the end of civilization again. It, in everything that comes on every single time i mean whether it was the i mean the original telephone by the way the privacy concerns are interesting because i don't want to make light of them but you know in the 1930s if you wanted to make a phone call you had to go down to the general store and you were talking in a public space and you actually spoke to an operator who would listen to your voice and plug you in and had the other part of the thing there and anybody else and then like 10 years later, we developed community lines. So there was one phone in your community and anybody in your neighborhood could listen to you. You talk about insecure. I mean, like everybody was listening in on phone calls. Even when I was a kid, um, the phone downstairs had an extension upstairs. And if you lifted it up really carefully and covered the mouthpiece, you could listen. I mean, so it's always been a problem. I would say in some sense our, our, our voice communications now are more secure than they've ever been. But, of course, now is the very time when everybody starts freaking out about privacy and so on. Well, at least, um, again, where it gets really worrying is when the state gets involved. And, That's right. Um, if all they're doing with our data is to send us adverts, then I'm not going to moan too much. It helps me um, know about products that I will like. That's actually quite a good thing. Um, on the other hand, I, I, I agree with you. And I, I like that. Actually, I don't think people are appreciative enough about this. People complain about Facebook, complain about Google, complain about, you know, Apple. Oh, these big companies have all our data. They're selling it around to private enterprise, which is trying to sell me stuff. Uh, I'm so glad that their private companies do this instead of the government, because like before the phones were deregulated, uh, government owned the phone in your home. Every, you know, AT and T was a government owned company. You know, uh, the only way to get messages to people was to put it in the U.S. Post Office, where they can investigate everything. To some extent, I think the the privatization of communication has made us more secure. And the fact is that both Apple and Google have resisted uh, 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 the most egregious attempts by the state. Uh, whether it was the clipper chip or whatever that thing was, and and even now they're very suspicious of these demands for, uh, for 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 data, and they refuse them a lot of time. And I I even feel kind of bad for Facebook, which was intimidated, I mean, grilled by the U.S. Congress, you know, on a repeated basis about allegedly manipulating the election by taking ads and running political ads for people. And now it's just crazy. Facebook is so risk averse; they don't they won't even run 
uh, they won't accept a, a post boost, you know, on a video that's about mm, politics. And I don't mean about like who you should vote for. I mean, like, here's a video denouncing Castro, you know, in Cuba. Uh, they're not going to run that. So uh, the intrusions into, into Facebook has actually been a lot of the reason for the problems at Facebook. But mostly, I would say these companies have been over been pretty good i don't mind the scrupulosity that people have about them you should always sure, be sure. vigilant but but i think actually there's a little bit of a hysteria uh nowadays and it's funny because like growing up we never had privacy in our communications at all ever 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 didn't expect it and i don't remember anybody complaining about it now we've de- developed an expectation of privacy and that's a good thing but that's also an achievement of the market Again, um, uh, pointing out what's right in front of us, actually, in many ways, um, we're, we're getting freer. Um, would you agree with that? I would. Yeah, no, there's no question. I mean, whatever the data is you look at, we are definitely getting freer. And I think along with that, politics is becoming ever more disreputable. And I think that is really fantastic. Um, I always like how um, it's just a personal aside but i always like how um if if it's a politician you like it's called a statesman but if, if you don't like him it's just called a politician it's it's become a uh, pejorative yeah isn't that funny we don't really use the word statesman anymore it's a it's a funny term i think we we associate statesmen with before world war ii maybe before world war one maybe it's 19th century term i don't know but we don't use it anymore <laughs> it's funny isn't it yeah i don't know maybe i was i was reading um uh, Benjamin Franklin or something and, and him talking about somebody how he was a proper statesman it's like well it, was that when being a politician was a was seen as a noble thing because uh, that's not in my lived experience at all in my my short life hardly anybody today thinks of politics as being productive and good and and it's unusual when you find somebody that comes to to the defense of politics and more often than not it's it's a pundit who makes his living by writing off of it and it's funny because you go back to somebody like um uh, 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 Schmidt's 1936 book, you know, in defense of politics, I think, what is the name of that book called? Um, the political something. And he was a Nazi and he loved politics because it divided people and it, and it fomented a war against, against all. And he hated liberalism because it was all about cooperation and, and trade, but he thought politics gave your life meaning. I mean, if there's somebody, you know, for whom politics gives their life meaning oh yeah i would say that's like a personality disorder in that case yeah <laughs> yeah if, if somebody's really passionate about politics there's always something slightly um suspicious about it I'm, i mean people accuse me of being interested in politics but i'm more it's more about the ideas it's about the um the underlying factors at work no, i'm not terribly interested in in party politics uh and all that um uh, the second thing I like about you, and you touched on it a little bit earlier, um, is that you remind us that freedom is not uh, an idea that preserves some fringe cult, us uh, libertarians, um, but it has a. It comes from a long intellectual tradition, and we we call that liberalism. Um, how are you getting on in your uh, in your mission to rescue the word liberalism? Well, you know, I think I've actually made some progress. And and I, th- I think it's not just a matter of developing a different kind of habit. Like, don't use liberalism as a pejorative, you know, to, to, to try to understand liberalism as this tradition of let society alone to develop it itself, you know, um, and to appreciate our liberal heritage and the technologies that it developed for restraining the state, walling off the state from the rest of society. I mean, that was a 500-year struggle. I mean, actually, John Stuart Mill calls it a thousand year struggle. I was just rereading his 1863 book, uh, 1869 book on the subject of women, subjection of women, in which he talks about this emancipation that gradually that took place over the centuries. And I think it's really important to appreciate that. And it does go by this one word, liberalism. That's the word we gradually over the centuries came to associate with this aspiration to free society from the state and this conviction that there's a potential for cooperation among people so long as you free them from authority and and grant equal freedoms to everybody. I think it's a beautiful idea. But it's more than that. I think we developed a problem after World War II when there was a perception we had lost the term liberalism because it came to be associated with 
New Deal and corporate planning. I mean, they basically stole it from us. We acquiesced to that reality. We're like, what are we going to call ourselves? And this big struggle went on. By 1956, this uh, translator at Bastiat uh, wrote an article. He said, look, um, we don't know what to call ourselves. We know what we believe. We believe society should be left alone. We should have free market. People, affairs should be managed uh, through an, uh, emergent rules and, and uh, that sort of thing. We should have peace, social peace, and life uh, made more peaceful through uh, the, the flourishing of commercial society and so on. Um, but we don't have a word to call ourselves. And he said, there's this leftover term from the late 19th century. It meant different things in different countries, but nowadays nobody uses it at all. And the word is libertarian. So let's start calling ourselves that. We know we're liberals, but we can't use that term anymore. So let's use the word libertarian. So that's an interesting idea, and I have no problem with it. The problem is that libertarianism is a very long and almost clinical sounding word. It has different meanings in the UK than it does in the US and in Australia. I have no idea what it means. Um, and it, so, it, but I think more profoundly what happened was that it, we intended, we, we adopted that word as a way of clarifying our views. What that word actually ended up doing is cutting ourselves off from our own history. So that we, lo we lost a sense of identity as part of something larger than ourselves, uh, part of a larger struggle dating back, you know, uh, as Mill says, a thousand years. And, and so we began to think of ourselves as a newly born movement with eccentric, strange views. And we began to think of ourselves as eccentrics and, and radicals and weirdos. Um, and I think that's been a problem for us because, in fact, uh, the trajectory of history over the last millennium has been to ever further... Uh, emancip emancipation, you know, through the commercial society, the end of slavery, the end of guilds, uh, uh, rights for women, uh, free trade, all these great achievements are, they are our achievements. But I think we're reluctant to take credit for them because we've kind of inadvertently, by use of uh, our eccentric language, cut ourselves off from our own history. So I think that's a more important reason to use the word liberal, so that we gain a greater sense of who we are. I would say it, it, all of those things are unspoken, almost unseen, because we all go in with the assumption that those are true. It's like, well, yeah, obviously. So what we're, what we're really arguing about is the, the minor details and what we call left and right, perhaps, are those minor details. Um, right. Whilst we should be standing back and saying, look at all these the amazing achievements we've had and we're really addressing, um, I don't know, the, the core of how our, of how our society runs these days. Um, and uh, I think it's important for us to still be there whilst acknowledging that um, uh, we've come a long way, that um, we don't, look, we don't um, get blasé about these, these foundational things. That's right. And, 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 and what, the great thing, too, is that once you sort of think of yourself as part of uh, this extended tradition, then you can go back and read uh, you know, Cobden and Bright and understand their struggle that they had against the Corn Laws in, in England. You know, you can, you can, you can, you can read uh, uh, Benjamin Constant and, and understand his, his, his essay that he wrote in 1820 um, about the difference between the liberty of the ancients and moderns. I mean, you can even go back and read some of the late uh, scholastics, you know, Wanda Mariana and so on. And, and see this sort of progressive unfolding of freedom coming out of the Middle Ages and the freedom of travel, what that meant, the rise of technologies that keep us safe, the um, ever more access to food. And like, if you have this perspective on history, you can go back and look at paintings of the High Renaissance. And why did they always want to put fruit on a table and, and draw a picture of it? Like, fruits are okay, but why do we have so many pictures of fruit? It's because fruit was new. This is glorious. And this is something you want to take a picture. You want to paint a picture of it, you know? I never thought about it like that. Yeah. I mean, so you begin to understand this. Or you understand the difference with the musical complexity of 1490 and 1590. What the hell happened, you know, between, between uh, uh, the, 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 the strange early work of Just Kent and the later works of Thomas Tallis? I mean, there, there is a world of difference that happened in the 100 years. What happened was the conviction that there was not going to be any more black death, that we had access now to fruits and vegetables, like the average person was actually making money, and they could move and they could travel freely. I mean, 
we saw the birth of this idea of progress. And with that birth, we saw our architecture improve, our paintings improve, our music got prettier, you know, everything. You know, the birth of kind of a, I would say, almost a classless society, you know, in, in, that, in that time. A time when you could imagine that within your lifespan, you could be made much better off by virtue of your own effort. That's an extraordinary dawn of realization that transformed humanity. We take it for granted now. It was a, yep. a transformation only made possible by liberalism. Now we get depressed if we're, um, we're at a standstill, whereas that was uh, the norm, um, you know, barely 200 years ago. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Um, who is a writer or thinker in the, in the long liberal tradition that not enough libertarians know about? Mm, I guess I would mention, I mentioned already Benjamin Constant already, and I really think everybody should read Benjamin Constant. Like, I always go back to his essay called The uh, Liberty of the Ancients, and the difference between the liberty of the ancients and the moderns. I think it's one of the most compelling essays I've ever read in the history of liberalism, and, and it's the one that uh, 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 Schmidt, why can't I remember his first name, um, that, that German thinker? Anyway, oh, this was... You. Yeah, uh, Carl, Carl Schmidt. Okay. Um, was still rubbing him wrong in 1936. He's like still pissed off at Benjamin Constant. I mean, that's really great, right? If you can right. haunt the next generation that well. So that's a great one. Um, another really interesting thinker from the, the late Victorian period is this a member of parliament called Auburn Herbert. I think it's a terrible name. And I think like it's not a memorable name, Auburn Herbert. Herbert. I mean, it just doesn't <laughs> make an impression. You know, it's not like Ayn Rand. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> yeah. But I'd say as a liberal thinker, he's almost, I would say he's nearly as perfect as any thinker I've ever read. Oh, wow. Yeah. I mean, he's like weirdly infallibly right about everything. Like you read his essays and you're like, wow, how did this guy have it all together? So he's, he's a good one. Okay, I uh, hope everybody in the audience is writing that down. Um, there's always more to learn. And actually, knowing that it is a longer tradition, um, you don't need to... Um, and obviously, everybody should read uh, Mises and, and Hayek and Rothbard and all that stuff. It's all great. But it goes back further than that. And I think it really, it really helps if you have a, um, a foundational understanding of where these um, ideas came from, because I think you'll, you'll be able to um, relay them much more confidently. Oh, I agree. Um, I just reread this past weekend because I wanted to write an article about the Women's March in D.C., which was like the most hilariously uh, ridiculous uh, circus you've ever seen. But I went back and, and read John Stuart Mill's 1869 book called uh, The Subjection of, Subjection of Women, the most perfectly liberal treatise on um, equal freedoms for the sexes. They've ever seen. He has all these asides explaining what liberalism is, and they're just really beautiful. And then I realized something really interesting about that book. Within feminist circles, people talk about first wave, second wave, and third wave feminism. The first wave begins with the suffragettes. The second wave happens with, I don't know, Gloria Steinem, or I don't know what. And the third wave is, Jesus Christ, you know, who knows? Um, <laughs> But what's interesting about this, the, about this taxonomy is it actually leaves out all the 19th century liberal thinkers who were in favor of ending what they call the subjective whim. In other words, it's the zero wave that's actually the best one, you know, and we don't even have a word for it. I mean, like our language has literally written this great treatise out of the existence of history. And I find that just disgusting. Perhaps um, libertarians have an aversion to these kind of things because uh, the culture wars have really um, poisoned um, this discussion. Um, if you if you really s a scratch, uh, most people are annoyed by the social justice warriors and all that stuff. Um, you know, uh, emancipation of women, great, absolutely. Um, and again, another reason why you should go back and understand where these things come from because uh, actually not too dissimilar to what you already believe. That's right. I mean, if you were a libertarian in 1810, you should have a passion for ending the legal restrictions on the right of women to accept jobs, move, marry whom they want, own, have bank accounts, sign contracts, sell their property, uh, choose their mates, 
uh, make choices about their life. I mean, th that should have been a burning passion for you. And by 1880s and 1890s, all this had become a reality. And that was due mostly to this liberal impulse uh, favoring equal freedom for everyone. And that's something we should be very sympathetic and get behind. What do you think about the word neoliberalism? Is that a real thing or is that just a slur? My uh, my colleague and I, Phil Magnus, disagree about this. And he has this super complicated, weird view of this subject that I can't even understand. I'm sure he's right and I'm wrong. But my understanding of it was that this word neoliberalism came about um, out of the Walter Lippmann Colloquium of 1936 that was held in Paris and brought in a lot of uh, liberal thinkers from around the world and tried to browbeat them into accepting a kind of mixed economy. It's like liberty is so important that we probably ought to impose it from the top down, <laughs> you know? Right. And um, that, I think, became – that was a serious problem and I think it's wrong. I really like uh, Lippmann's book called The Good Society. It's a weird book, though, because you read the first half and it's, like, brilliant. And then the second half, you're like, wait, that's weird. <laughs> <laughs> and it never stops being weird until the end. And I think it's, I think it's like, the first half's right and the second half's wrong. Uh, li neoliberalism is liberalism – uh, the conviction of liberalism is so good that we ought to impose it at a point of a gun. Uh, that's how I see neo neoliberalism. To put it as um, crudely as possible, I suppose, uh, it's kind of like liberalism, but with a load of rubbish added in. You know, a little bit of socialism, a little bit of um, bombing Iraq, you know. Yeah, a little bit of IMF, uh, yeah, a little bit of war. <laughs> yeah. Something like that, yeah. All of a sudden it turns into exactly the opposite of what we want. Exactly. That's how Lippmann conceived of it. That generation was really, I mean, it's easy to critique on them. But, you know, in 1936, when you had the rise of the Nazis all over Europe, and by the last time you had the Nuremberg Laws already, that were uh, deprecating Jews specifically, uh, you know, all over the German territories, you had the rise of the New Deal. Uh, which is a corporate fascist state. And you had, uh, you know, Italy being taken over by Mussolini, who thought he had the perfect plan for the world. And Stalin was in Russia further entrenching totalitarianism. It was a bad time. And so that generation just thought, look, we've got, we've got, we've got it bad. What are we going to do? And so they tried to cobble together something like a compromise between all the various systems that, and, and the, within this compromise, we would leave free people basically free to speak and trade and that sort of thing so i understand the impulse i mean it's, it's really easy for us in 2019 to look back at those guys and go oh man you shouldn't have sold out like this but it was a it was a tough time and then nobody even knew if freedom was going to survive that unbelievable fiasco of the interwar period what a disaster right um it's uh it's difficult to uh, empathize with that because yeah it's, it's so easy for us um and that's uh that's a big problem with um the yeah, internet armchair intellectuals to uh to go I, oh yes uh, this person from 200 years ago has, hasn't had the benefit of um you know 200 years of thought so yeah or they're wrong or something like that yeah why is it walter Lippmann like murray rothbard yeah okay <laughs> yeah <it's> fine <laughs> how do you decide what to write about um i have no plan I wait for – what's this? There's a show on television that says that you should uh, choose what you have in your house based on the – does it spark joy? So, uh, you know, that line has become a, like an internet meme. Does it spark joy? Keep it. If it doesn't, right. throw it out. And I – actually, that's how I go about my editorial writing is I just try to find something that sparks joy and and write about it. And honestly, I write best when I'm filled with a, a the adrenaline and that only comes about because of fear that I don't have anything to write about. So I deliberately deny myself access to any kind of plan uh, so as to make myself a little bit terrified. And then that just inspires something within me. That's very interesting because I really sense that it's kind of like um, uh, you're, 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 you're typing with um, one butt cheek like that, you know, just, just type typing away like that and, and just comes streaming out of you like a pure whirlwind of inspiration. And you kind of, I, um, yeah. In between that, uh, in between chaos and order there. That's right. And I try to maintain that balance. I really do. I try to always, uh, cause it's, it's always dangerous actually when you try to get too orderly, at least for me, because, it, because it leads to a lack of inspiration. So I try to maintain a little bit of chaos and a lot of fear. And that, that's what like, fuels me it's like an addiction it's like a, almost a chemical addiction like oh i'm terrible i've run out of ideas i don't have anything to say jesus and then i'm 
it's that terror that I'm I'm finished, you know. And then I look and I see a coffee cup and I, I just see something and then it, it, it makes music in my head and then I just move on it. And then I get weirdly passionate about a single idea over the course of a day and then it's done. Now, um, your detractors might say, well, you can, it's easy for you to say that because you're such an experienced writer and you've um, paid your dues and gone through the hard slog of just, just writing. You know how they say, um, just sit down and start typing and then inspiration will come. Um, maybe that's right. I don't know if that's true or not, but maybe that's true. I don't, I don't really, I'm not really sure about that. I sometimes get really embarrassed about things that I wrote like 20 years ago. I'm like, that's kind of dumb. Um, you know, a little bit pedantic and silly, and maybe you, we all have to kind of go through that phase. I, at AIR, I've gotten better about turning down articles by people I don't think are really ready uh, to go public yet. Um, because we do, as writers, go through an imitative phase. And I tell you what, the single most debilitating thing from a writer is fear of the audience. Um, and this, this is young writers are consumed by this. They're like, oh, what's my mom going to think? Wait, what about my pastor? Oh, what about my fifth grade teacher? What about my college roommate? You know, and they start getting consumed with fear of what all these various people are going to think about them. So they start pretending to be something that they're not. Uh, oh, what about my professor? And so on and so on. It just gradually unfolds like this and to the point that they, they're, it's inauthentic. That it's not true, and they don't allow themselves to think and create because they're so consumed with fear of the audience. You really have to work through that and forget about that, and learn how to just like use that uh, chest spreader, open it up, and bleed on the page, and be as true and authentic and honest and earnest and and truth telling as you possibly can. If you can't write about a subject with a conviction that you're being 100% earnest truthful um, and analytically rigorous and telling everything you know in the most authentic way you know it to be true and you're not embarrassed but if you can't do that I just don't think you should write I really don't and this is sometimes why I like to take on really dangerous topics uh, to write about them as with as much moral earnesty as I can possibly muster. Like a few days ago, I decided to write about the topic of discrimination, and particularly as it p p pertains to same-sex couples. And I wanted to defend, of course, uh, the right to discriminate or the freedom to associate, you know. But I wanted to do it in a way that was not cagey, or overly scripted, I wanted it to be as forthright, honest, and open um, as I possibly could. Like I wanted it to be a hum wanted it to be humane, you know. Right? So I had to actually sit and think about this topic for a couple of days. And like, you know, if you're writing about a controversial topic like this, and you want it to be th like that, morally honest, and also not, um, how would you say, like. Provoc pointlessly provocative, you know, then it takes some, it takes some thought and, and there's a certain sort of mental settling in you have to do to, to achieve that. I set these problems up for myself because I like to see if I'm up to it. I was happy with the results, actually. I did see the headline, but I didn't see it, um, uh, didn't read it. Um, but I do, I do think you, you really st strike the right, right tone with your articles and, um, uh, it's, it's human. I find that a lot of libertarian writing is it can be very clinical and cold. Yeah. And this is this is the way of life, and this is this is how it is. But oh, but some people are really experienced. People are really some people are frustrated by this. Like my friend Stefan Kinsella, I run always run my writing by him, and he's like, I don't know. He said, you know, I don't feel like you ever really demonstrate anything. It seems like you're kind of like this literary storyteller with a lot of intuitions and some smattering of historical knowledge, and you just kind of put it into this big uh, uh, song, and you expect me to be entertained by it. <laughs> I'm like, okay, sorry. Sorry, I didn't delight you, but that, I don't know. I don't. Here's the other thing. Oh, this is very important to me when I realize this. We have great thinkers in our tradition. I mean, Mises wrote Human Action. Hayek wrote The Constitution of Liberty. Adam Smith wrote The Wealth of Nations and uh, Theory of Moral Sentiments. These are done. These 
great thinkers have done these great things for us. We don't have to do them again. Right. We can act as if we're building on capital that, that they gave us and go, I, you know, I think the worst thing that would ever happened is if the world blew up and people were only left with my writings. I think it would just, like, it would be the worst thing that ever happened because I mostly riff on what's already been done in the past, but I, I, th- I think it's wise to, as a writer, presume that you have this foundation beneath you and then go for it. And it's also the fact that I'm not intellectually capable of being Mises or Hayek or Smith, and that's fine. There's nothing wrong with it. Sure. I've tried to find the thing that I do best and just do it as much as I can. Yeah, I've been trying to learn that with my writings recently. I think when I first began, I was trying to um... – it's actually not a bad thing to try and do to see if you can kind of understand the ideas to try and recreate them in your own words. Oh, for sure. But I think once you get more experience, you do have to kind of um, find what you yeah, uh, you know, not to put myself down, not, not Rothbard's uh, it's not going to happen. Or even Kinsella who, who actually does that bring something has brought something new to the, so, to the tradition. So it definitely you, has. So you expect that. Yeah, he's he's a great writer and a great thinker. But, you know, Stefan's ideas were wonderful, but actually I, I were never persuaded by them until I read uh, uh, another book on the same topic of intellectual property that put a little more flesh on his bones. And then I realized Stefan was right about everything. But it took another writer besides Stefan to make me realize that Stefan was right. So everything works together in this kind of lovely dynamic. I'm glad that you and uh, Stefan Kinsella are friends because... Um... Two completely different personalities and kind of keeping the liberty movement together. All <laughs> these factions splitting off. Yeah. Um, and you. lastly, and most importantly, um, before I let you go, um, one of my colleagues wants to know how you keep your bow ties looking that crisp and fresh. Oh, interesting. Uh, is the tie or the collar? Well, the collar is detachable. And that's, I'll just tell you that that's actually one thing that I do is I just make sure that I have my shirts and my collar separate. So I, yeah, so that's a kind of a, a little bit of an eccentricity. Uh, beyond that, I tie them a little tighter and a little shorter than you typically see. So they're, they're not sort of floppy and falling everywhere. That's just it. <laughs> it's just, that's a geeky question and a geeky answer. <laughs> well, wouldn't expect anything less. Um, what do you think, um, who, who should wear a bow tie? Is it, is it for somebody who has that little bit of eccentricity to them? Well, there's a book that came out in 1954 uh, about men's dress, and he said uh, that a gentleman should never wear a bow tie, especially to a job interview, because uh, the cultural association with uh, bow ties is that of a bomb thrower. Oh, right. <laughs> so, Interesting. I can't help it. Like, maybe well, I just like to throw bombs. I quite like it because you have the suits and the shirt and the pants and, uh, and the shoes, everything normal. And then you have this kind of radical thing here. And so it's, <laughs> you've got a bit of um, Adam Smith in the suit, but then you've got a little bit of Rothbard in the, in the bow tie. Sweet Mary. Love uh, thanks so much, uh, Jeffrey, for coming on the show. Um, before I let you go, um, is there anything you'd like to plug? Anything? Uh, sure. Well, you know about? Uh, American Institute for Economic Research. I'm investing my whole heart into this place, and I'm very proud of the results. So check us out at AIR.org. Okay, thank you very much, and thank you all for watching. Um, See you next time.